Section 3 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 3 The Pomegranate Seeds, Part 1. Mother Ceres was exceedingly fond of her daughter Proserpina, and seldom let her go alone into the fields. But, just at the time when my story begins, the good lady was very busy, because she had the care of the wheat, and the Indian corn, and the rye, and barley, and, in short, of the crops of every kind all over the earth. And as the season had thus far been uncommonly backward, it was necessary to make the harvest ripen more speedily than usual. So she put on her turban, made of poppies, a kind of flower which she was always noted for wearing, and got into her car drawn by a pair of winged dragons, and was just ready to set off. "'Dear mother,' said Proserpina, "'I shall be very lonely while you are away. May I not run down to the shore and ask some of the sea nymphs to come up out of the waves and play with me?' "'Yes, child,' answered Mother Ceres. The sea nymphs are good creatures and will never lead you into any harm, but you must take care not to stray away from them, nor go wandering about the fields by yourself. Young girls without their mothers to take care of them are very apt to get into mischief. The child promised to be as prudent as if she were a grown-up woman, and by the time the winged dragons had whirled the car out of sight, she was already on the shore calling to the sea nymphs to come and play with her. They knew Proserpina's voice, and were not long in showing their glistening faces and sea-green hair above the water, at the bottom of which was their home. They brought along with them a great many beautiful shells, and sitting down on the moist sand, where the surf wave broke over them, they busied themselves in making a necklace which they hung around Proserpina's neck. By way of showing her gratitude, the child besought them to go with her a little way into the fields, so that they might gather abundance of flowers, with which she would make each of her kind playmates a wreath. "'Oh, no, dear Proserpina,' cried the sea-nymphs, "'we dare not go with you upon the dry land. We are apt to grow faint, unless at every breath we can snuff up the salt breeze of the ocean. And don't you see how careful we are to let the surf wave break over us every moment or two, so as to keep ourselves comfortably moist?' If it were not for that, we should soon look like bunches of uprooted seaweed dried in the sun. "'It is a great pity,' said Proserpina, "'but do you wait for me here, and I will run and gather my apron full of flowers, and be back again before the surf wave has broken ten times over you. I long to make you some wreaths that shall be as lovely as this necklace of many-coloured shells.' "'We will wait, then,' answered the sea-nymphs, "'but while you are gone, we may as well lie down on a bank of soft sponge under the water. The air today is a little too dry for our comfort, but we will pop up our heads every few minutes to see if you are coming. The young Proserpina ran quickly to a spot where, only the day before, she had seen a great many flowers. These, however, were now a little past their bloom, and wishing to give her friends the freshest and loveliest blossoms, she strayed farther into the fields, and found some that made her scream with delight. Never had she met with such exquisite flowers before, violets so large and fragrant, roses with so rich and delicate a blush, such superb hyacinths, and such aromatic pinks, and many others, some of which seemed to be of new shapes and colours. Two or three times, moreover, she could not help thinking that a tuft of most splendid flowers had suddenly sprouted out of the earth before her very eyes, as if on purpose to tempt her a few steps farther. Proserpina's apron was soon filled and brimming over with delightful blossoms. She was on the point of turning back in order to rejoin the sea nymphs and sit with them on the moist sands, all twining wreaths together. But, a little farther on, what should she behold? It was a large shrub, completely covered with the most magnificent flowers in the world. "'The darlings!' cried Proserpina. And then she thought to herself, I was looking at that spot only a moment ago. How strange it is that I did not see the flowers. The nearer she approached the shrub, 
the more attractive it looked, until she came quite close to it, and then, although its beauty was richer than words can tell, she hardly knew whether to like it or not. It bore above a hundred flowers of the most brilliant hues, and each different from the others, but all having a kind of resemblance among themselves, which showed them to be sister blossoms. But there was a deep, glossy luster on the leaves of the shrub, and on the petals of the flowers, that made Proserpina doubt whether they might not be poisonous. To tell you the truth, foolish as it may seem, she was half inclined to turn round and run away. "'What a silly child I am,' thought she, taking courage. "'It is really the most beautiful shrub that ever sprang out of the earth. "'I will pull it up by the roots and carry it home, "'and plant it in my mother's garden.' "'Holding her apron full of flowers with her left hand, "'Proserpina seized the large shrub with the other, "'and pulled and pulled, "'but it was hardly able to loosen the soil about its roots. "'What a deep-rooted plant it was!' Again the girl pulled with all her might, and observed that the earth began to stir and crack to some distance around the stem. She gave another pull, but relaxed her hold, fancying that there was a rumbling sound right beneath her feet. Did the roots extend down into some enchanted cavern? Then, laughing at herself for so childish a notion, she made another effort. Up came the shrub, and Proserpina staggered back, holding the stem triumphantly in her hand, and gazing at the deep hole which its roots had left in the soil. Much to her astonishment, this hole kept spreading wider and wider, and growing deeper and deeper, until it really seemed to have no bottom, and all the while there came a rumbling noise out of its depths, louder and louder, and nearer and nearer, and sounding like the tramp of horses' hoofs and the rattling of wheels. Too much frightened to run away, she stood straining her eyes into this wonderful cavity, and soon saw a team of four sable horses snorting smoke out of their nostrils and tearing their way out of the earth, with a splendid golden chariot whirling at their heels. They leaped out of the bottomless hole, chariot and all, and there they were, tossing their black manes, flourishing their black tails, and curveting with every one of their hoofs off the ground at once, close by the spot where Proserpina stood. In the chariot sat the figure of a man, richly dressed, with a crown on his head, all flaming with diamonds. He was of a noble aspect, and rather handsome, but looked sullen and discontented, and he kept rubbing his eyes and shading them with his hand, as if he did not live enough in the sunshine to be very fond of its light. As soon as this personage saw the affrighted Proserpina, he beckoned her to come a little nearer. "'Do not be afraid,' said he, with as cheerful a smile as he knew how to put on. "'Come, will you not like to ride a little way with me in my beautiful chariot?' But Proserpina was so alarmed that she wished for nothing but to get out of his reach, and no wonder. The stranger did not look remarkably good-natured, in spite of his smile, and as for his voice, its tones were deep and stern, and sounded as much like the rumbling of an earthquake underground as anything else. As is always the case with children in trouble, Proserpina's first thought was to call for her mother. "'Mother! Mother Ceres!' cried she, all in a tremble. "'Come quickly and save me!' But her voice was too faint for her mother to hear. Indeed, it is most probable that Ceres was then a thousand miles off, making the corn grow in some far distant country. Nor could it have availed her poor daughter even had she been within hearing, for no sooner did Proserpina begin to cry out than the stranger leaped to the ground, caught the child in his arms, and again mounting the chariot, shook the reins and shouted to the four horses to set off. They immediately broke into so swift a gallop that it seemed rather like flying through the air than running along the earth. In a moment Proserpina lost sight of the pleasant vale of Enna in which she had always dwelt. Another instant, and even the summit of Mount Etna had become so blue in the distance that she could scarcely distinguish it from the smoke that gushed out of its crater. But still the poor child screamed and scattered her full apron of flowers along the way, and left a long cry trailing behind the chariot. And many mothers, to whose ears it came, ran quickly to see if any mischief had befallen their children. 
but Mother Ceres was a great way off and could not hear the cry. As they rode on, the stranger did his best to soothe her. "'Why should you be so frightened, my pretty child?' said he, trying to soften his rough voice. "'I promise not to do you any harm. "'What, you have been gathering flowers? "'Wait till we come to my palace, and I will give you a garden full of prettier flowers than those, "'all made of pearls and diamonds and rubies. "'Can you guess who I am? "'They call my name Pluto, and I am the king of diamonds and all other precious stones.' Every atom of the gold and silver that lies under the earth belongs to me, to say nothing of the copper and iron, and of the coal mines which supply me with abundance of fuel. Do you see this splendid crown upon my head? You may have it for a plaything. Oh, we shall be very good friends, and you will find me more agreeable than you expect when once we get out of this troublesome sunshine. Let me go home, cried Proserpina. Let me go home. "'My home is better than your mother's,' answered King Pluto. "'It is a palace, all made of gold, with crystal windows, "'and because there is little or no sunshine thereabouts, "'the apartments are illuminated with diamond lamps. "'You never saw anything half so magnificent as my throne. "'If you like, you may sit down on it, "'and be my little queen, and I will sit on the footstool.' "'I don't care for golden palaces and thrones,' sobbed Proserpina, Oh, my mother, my mother, carry me back to my mother. But King Pluto, as he called himself, only shouted to his steeds to go faster. Pray do not be foolish, Proserpina, said he, in rather a sullen tone. I offer you my palace and my crown, and all the riches that are under the earth, and you treat me as if I were doing you an injury. The one thing which my palace needs is a merry little maid to run upstairs and down, and cheer up the rooms with her smile, and this is what you must do for King Pluto. Never, answered Proserpina, looking as miserable as she could. I shall never smile again till you set me down at my mother's door. But she might just as well have talked to the wind that whistled past them, for Pluto urged on his horses and went faster than ever. Proserpina continued to cry out, and screamed so long and so loudly that her poor little voice was almost screamed away, and when it was nothing but a whisper, she happened to cast her eyes over a great broad field of waving grain, and whom do you think she saw? Whom but Mother Ceres making the corn grow, and too busy to notice the golden chariot as it went rattling along. The child mustered all her strength, and gave one more scream, but was out of sight before Ceres had time to turn her head. King Pluto had taken a road which now began to grow excessively gloomy. It was bordered on each side by rocks and precipices, between which the rumbling of the chariot wheels was reverberated with a noise like rolling thunder. The trees and bushes that grew in the crevices of the rocks had very dismal foliage, and by and by, although it was hardly noon, the air became obscured with a grey twilight. The black horses had rushed along so swiftly that they were already beyond the limits of the sunshine. But the duskier it grew, the more did Pluto's visage assume an air of satisfaction. After all, he was not an ill-looking person, especially when he left off twisting his features into a smile that did not belong to them. Proserpina peeped at his face through the gathering dusk, and hoped that he might not be so very wicked as she at first thought him. "'Ah, this twilight is truly refreshing,' said King Pluto, "'after being so tormented with that ugly and impertinent glare of the sun. "'How much more agreeable is lamplight or torchlight, "'more particularly when reflected from diamonds? "'It will be a magnificent sight when we get to my palace.' "'Is it much farther?' asked Proserpina. "'And will you carry me back when I have seen it?' "'We will talk of that by and by,' answered Pluto. "'We are just entering my dominions.' Do you see that tall gateway before us? When we pass those gates, we are at home, and there lies my faithful mastiff at the threshold. Cerberus, Cerberus, come hither, my good dog. So saying, Pluto pulled at the reins and stopped the chariot right between the tall, massive pillars of the gateway. The mastiff of which he had spoken got up from the threshold and stood on his hinder legs, so as to put his forepaws on the chariot wheel. "'But my stars, what a strange dog it was! "'Why, he was a big, rough, ugly-looking monster, 
with three separate heads, and each of them fiercer than the two others. But fierce as they were, King Pluto patted them all. He seemed as fond of his three-headed dog as if he had been a sweet little spaniel with silken ears and curly hair. Cerberus, on the other hand, was evidently rejoiced to see his master, and expressed his attachment as other dogs do by wagging his tail at great rate. Proserpina's eyes being drawn to it by its brisk motion, she saw that his tail was neither more nor less than a live dragon, with fiery eyes and fangs that had a very poisonous aspect. And while the three-headed Cerberus was fawning so lovingly on King Pluto, there was the dragon tail wagging against its will, and looking as cross and ill-natured as you can imagine, on its own separate account. "'Will the dog bite me?' asked Proserpina, shrinking closer to Pluto. "'What an ugly creature he is!' "'Oh, never fear,' answered her companion. "'He never harms people unless they try to enter my dominions without being sent for, "'or to get away when I wish to keep them here. "'Down, Cerberus. "'Now, my pretty Proserpina, we will drive on.' "'On went the chariot, and King Pluto seemed greatly pleased "'to find himself once more in his own kingdom. "'He drew Proserpina's attention.' to the rich veins of gold that were to be seen among the rocks, and pointed to several places where one stroke of a pickaxe would loosen a bushel of diamonds. All along the road, indeed, there were sparkling gems, which would have been of inestimable value above ground, but which were here reckoned of the meaner sort and hardly worth a beggar's stooping for. Not far from the gateway they came to a bridge which seemed to be built of iron, Pluto stopped the chariot and bade Proserpina look at the stream which was gliding so lazily beneath it. Never in her life had she beheld so torpid, so black, so muddy-looking a stream. Its waters reflected no images of anything that was on the banks, and it moved as sluggishly as if it had quite forgotten which way it ought to flow, and had rather stagnate than flow either one way or the other. "'This is the river Lethe, observed King Pluto. "'Is it not a very pleasant stream?' "'I think it a very dismal one,' said Proserpina. "'It suits my taste, however,' answered Pluto, "'who was apt to be sullen when anybody disagreed with him. "'At all events, its water has one very excellent quality, "'for a single draught of it makes people forget every care and sorrow "'that has hitherto tormented them. "'Only sip a little of it, my dear Proserpina, "'and you will instantly cease to grieve for your mother,' and will have nothing in your memory that can prevent you of being perfectly happy in my palace. I will send for some in a golden goblet the moment we arrive. Oh, no, 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 cried Proserpina, weeping afresh. I had a thousand times rather be miserable with remembering my mother than be happy in forgetting her. That dear, dear mother, I never, never will forget her. "'We shall see,' said King Pluto. "'You do not know what fine times we will have in my palace. "'Here we are just at the portal. "'These pillars are solid gold, I assure you.' "'He alighted from the chariot, and taking Proserpina in his arms, "'carried her up a lofty flight of steps into the great hall of the palace. "'It was splendidly illuminated by means of large precious stones of various hues, "'which seemed to burn like so many lamps.' and glowed with a hundredfold radiance all through the vast apartment. And yet there was a kind of gloom in the midst of this enchanted light, nor was there a single object in the hall that was really agreeable to behold, except the little Proserpina herself, a lovely child, with one earthly flower which she had not let fall from her hand. It is my opinion that even King Pluto had never been happy in his palace, and that this was the true reason why he had stolen away Proserpina, in order that he might have something to love, instead of cheating his heart any longer with this tiresome magnificence. And though he pretended to dislike the sunshine of the upper world, yet the effect of the child's presence, bedimmed as she was by her tears, was as if a faint and watery sunbeam had somehow or other found its way into the enchanted hall. Pluto now summoned his domestics, and bade them lose no time in preparing a most sumptuous banquet, and above all things not to fail of setting a golden beaker of the water of Lethe by Proserpina's plate. "'I will neither drink that nor anything else,' said Proserpina, 
nor will I taste a morsel of food, even if you keep me forever in your palace. I should be sorry for that, replied King Pluto, patting her cheek, for he really wished to be kind, if he had only known how. You are a spoiled child, I perceive, my little Proserpina, but when you see the nice things which my cook will make for you, your appetite will quickly come again. Then, sending for the head cook, he gave strict orders that all sorts of delicacies, such as young people are usually fond of, should be set before Proserpina. He had a secret motive in this, for, you are to understand, it is a fixed law that, when persons are carried off to the land of magic, if they once taste any food there, they can never get back to their friends. Now, if King Pluto had been cunning enough to offer Proserpina some fruit, or bread and milk, which was the simplest fare to which the child had always been accustomed, it is very probable that she would soon have been tempted to eat it. But he left the matter entirely to his cook, who, like all other cooks, considered nothing fit to eat unless it were rich pastry, or highly seasoned meat, or spiced sweet cakes, things which Proserpine's mother had never given her, and the smell of which quite took away her appetite instead of sharpening it. End of section three.